we're going tonight to the letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. I will be reading bits and pieces from there, but really, if you actually want to follow along with me in the word, then you need to go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. So I'm going to actually be starting in Revelation 2 and 3 a little bit, and I'll go back and forth, but the body of the study comes from Zechariah chapter 4, and it will all make sense later, hopefully uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But let me start here with the way that Jesus introduced himself in the book of Revelation as he spoke to each of the churches. Look at this. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. And the very first verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today. We are looking for your word to this church. Holy Spirit, we submit to your authority tonight and ask you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and flip with me to Zechariah chapter 4. Our focus tonight is on this concept of the lampstand. As we work through the book of Revelation, it is necessary for us to begin to pick and choose and work through the symbolism that we are about to see and receive. It hasn't been all that long ago that we worked through the seven letters to the seven churches. We took them one at a time. We wrestled through them. That was... Uh, just a few months ago, I guess. Well, maybe six months ago now. Man, can you believe it's been that long ago? Tonight, we're going to remind ourselves of each of those letters, but we're going to take a closer look at the concept of the lampstand from Zechariah chapter 4. Now, to help you understand something tonight, you're going to begin to see and understand a lot of symbolism as we work through this. A lot of symbolism and a lot of prophecy is revealed and unfolds in stages and in multiple ways. Let me um, explain that to you maybe just a little bit before we get in. It, later in the book of Revelation, we will talk about the abomination of desolation. And we will talk about the time that the Antichrist will set himself up as God within the temple. But the abomination of desolation has also already been fulfilled in ancient Rome. When the ancient Romans put themselves into the temple and sacrificed a pig in the Holy of Holies. That's what caused the Maccabean revolt, if you're familiar with the history. And so there is this unfolding and layering of prophecy and symbolism. Things that are true both then and now and in the future. Things where we can see tastes. Things where we can see that the Old Testament phrase that they use is types and shadows. You've probably heard that before. So we will begin to look tonight back in Zechariah chapter 4. Because Zechariah is one of the prophets. He is a prophet during the time of ancient Israel being captive in Babylon. And so Zechariah is speaking to the people who are coming back from Babylon and beginning to rebuild Jerusalem. 
and they're actually in this sort of holding pattern now. We've talked about it a little bit before in the past because a lot of the prophetic writing is happening during this time period. A man named Zerubbabel is trying to lead the people of Israel to rebuild Jerusalem. But they are so surrounded by the enemies of Israel that they, they sort of just do a little bit and stop. And now they're in the middle of, we don't know what to do, we don't feel safe, we don't know whether to keep going, we don't know whether to rebuild, we don't know whether to go back to Babylon, or we're sort of not even sure if we can live here anymore. And into that situation, the Lord speaks to the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah will speak to ancient Israel. He will speak to Zerubbabel. And he will also give us a taste, a foreshadowing of our age and the end of time. And we will see all that here in Zechariah chapter 4. I pray under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that he's able to reveal it to us and help us to make sense. Make sense. So we are in Zechariah chapter 4. In verse 1, we're going to read through the whole thing, and then we'll go back and look at it. I will try to compose myself as we read through. If you're familiar with Zechariah chapter 4, then you've already got your Holy Ghost ready in your back pocket. <laughs> and the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. I'm tempted to stop there, but if I do that every time, we'll never get finished. So let me keep going. I'll come back to it. And he said to me, what do you see? Now, this is an angel speaking to the prophet. What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right hand of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? By the way, the word Lord there is not, is the general word for Lord, um, not the same word that's used of God as Lord in the Old Testament, just in case you're curious. Verse 5, then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this almost seems completely out of the blue, almost as if he's not even answering the question. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. He's not finished yet. We normally stop there, but he's not done yet. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he, woo, that's, that's a good word right there. And he shall bring forward the top stone, um, the cornerstone, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. There's a good spot for a hallelujah. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And the second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes? Notice he asks him twice. Beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out. And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that there is an unfolding and a layering and a, a multiple understanding of some of these prophetic symbols because it will be necessary a few chapters down the road for us to come back to exactly this spot. Because when we talk about the two witnesses, the two witnesses are explained right here. I'm going to wet your whistle with that and then I'm not going to touch it again. But at the same time, I, by the way, um, 
the popular opinion about the two witnesses is that it will be um, uh, maybe yeah, Elijah and what's that? Enoch and Elijah. Yeah, Enoch and Elijah. That's the popular opinion with it. I don't think that's the case, although that does make sense. I think that it will be the people that are discussed here in Zechariah chapter 3 and Zechariah chapter 4, but we will have to wait and see. But we'll talk about that more later. So the opening phrase of Zechariah chapter 4 here begins by saying, The angel came to me and woke me. And I just love that in my spirit. Don't, wouldn't you just like it that if every time God spoke to you, if every time you just cracked the Bible, if every time you went to him in prayer, he just woke you up. I, I pray, Lord, wake me up. Because I'm the first one that needs to be woke up sometime. What's happening here is the prophet has not been physically sleep, sleeping. He is so overwhelmed with what just happened in Zechariah chapter 3 that he is in a stupor. Uh, you have to go back and read that for yourself. It will be worth your time. I promise you that. He sees what God is doing and what he plans to do, what he promises to do, and his mind is blown. And then the angel comes back to him and says, hey, we're not done yet. Wake up. And he says to him again, what do you see? And I just love that we see this from the Lord. And if you have read Old Testament prophecy, then we see this happen a lot. Where the angel or God himself speaking to the prophet will say, what do you see? What does it look like to you? It's a conversation that God actually still has with us. And he wants us to have an honest conversation with him about what we understand that he is saying about what we understand that he is showing. And what I've learned over the years, especially coming into ministry, especially having experienced God call me to make major decisions in my life, about have God having spoken things to me as the pastor of this church in the directions that we have to go and how we should do certain things, that it has been necessary upon occasion for me to go, Lord, this is what I see. If that's what you're saying, then confirm that to me. But if it's not, then you need to wake me up because what I'm seeing is this. And that's exactly what the prophet and the angel are doing here. Prophet, what do you see? And the angel, or the prophet rather, responds to him. Here's what I see. I see a lampstand of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it. Now, what's interesting here that we see one lampstand. Now, let, let me connect it back to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, how many lampstands does the Apostle John see? Seven. He sees seven lampstands. This lampstand that Zechariah sees is one lampstand with seven lamps. In the book of Revelation, we see each of them, seven of them, separate, distinct from each other. And Christ will speak to each one individually. To the prophet Zechariah, he sees them combined, united into one lampstand. What he is not being shown yet is that his lampstand is something that doesn't exist in the time of Zechariah. And something that has only just begun to exist in the time of the Apostle John. The lampstand is the church. And we know this because Jesus himself, speaking in Revelation chapter 1 closes the chapter by saying these seven lampstands are the seven churches. It was nice of him to lay that out nice and clear for us. And so the lampstand that we see is the church. The lampstand that Zechariah thinks he sees, and in a way, a type and shadow, it's true. He thinks he is seeing a lampstand that is Israel. He thinks he is seeing the people of God and the work that God is doing there in that day. And so the angel speaks to him of what God is doing there that day with ancient Israel. And so we have to understand, this prophecy is specifically true that day to them and this day to us. To them, we see that God was rebuilding Jerusalem, bringing in Zechariah, and you'll have to go back and look to see who Joshua is, because there's a high priest named Joshua, who is a very important character in the Old Testament that we never quite get around to talking about enough. That's what happens in the previous chapter, by the way. So the, the prophet sees God is doing something then. 
The prophet sees God has this lampstand, and here it is. There are seven of them. We learned last week that the number seven is a symbol of perfection and completeness. And so then it was a symbol of God bringing his remnant, his people, back to Israel and rebuilding all of what he has for Israel. To us, the seven lampstands are a complete picture of the church. Those churches, in their ways, represent all the churches from all time. They represent them unfolding over the years. They represent the stages that churches go through. They represent the churches that are fighting and pushing in. They represent the churches that are falling asleep and dying away. They represent every church everywhere in between. And they are a lampstand. Now, here's what we can see about a lampstand. And here's why it's important to understand the connection between a lampstand and the church. The lampstand holds the light. You see that? It is the device that is used to hold up light so that light can shine out and fill a room. In the same way, Jesus said, I am the light. And just to mess with you, he says, you are the light. You must be the light, like a city set on a hill, so that whoever is looking from far away sees that light from a great distance. That's the purpose of the lampstand. I know the camera can barely see me from way over here, but you guys can see me. This is a pretty bright light, actually. It's a pretty good lamp. And you can see the stamp is the lamp stand is made in a way that holds up the light to the place where it needs to shine. This light is the gospel. This stand is the church. It has been now, and always will be, God's plan to use the church to spread his gospel. There is no plan B. His plan is the church. His plan was not ancient Israel. It was leading ancient Israel to bring forth the Messiah and to become the church. And so we will see in the end days, when we are all gathered in heaven a few chapters from now in the book of Revelation, we will see the church complete, and it will be, yes, people that are Jewish from Israel who have come to faith in Christ, and it will be people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And all together, we will stand... <laughs> On that day, it doesn't matter what your skin is or where you came from. There you go. We're all going to be there. And we will look back and we will marvel at what Paul called the great mystery. This is in the book of Ephesians. The apostle Paul is explaining, Jewish people, here's what you don't understand. Here is the mystery. God has always planned to unite a people for himself. And he calls this people the church. The ancient prophet Zechariah received this message, seeing what would be the church, having no concept that God would do such a magnificent, amazing, powerful thing. And he believes, and rightfully so, because this is the language that the Lord uses to communicate to him. He believes that we are speaking only of Israel. And so he speaks about Israel. And symbolically, we can now understand what he was saying to the church. And so he says, I see a lampstand of gold. I see a church filled with beauty, without blemish, spotless, and perfect. I see a church. Now look, here's where it gets curious. Because there's something odd about the way this lampstand is designed. We've already talked about the way that it is one united lampstand. In the book of Revelation, there are seven distinct churches. In Zechariah, it is one body of Christ. One lampstand. But this lampstand is designed with a bowl on the top. And then there are the seven lamps on them. And each of the lamps have lips on them. Uh, the lip that it's referring to is like one of these edges, the, what would protect the light as it goes around. So what's curious about 
this lampstand is the bowl at the top that really sets it apart as a distinct feature, something odd about a lamp is the bowl on top. And just to make it all the more curious, we see two olive trees next to it. Now these two olive trees, later on there's a reference to these two olive trees being the witnesses in the end days. This is why I believe that um, from Zechariah we can learn that Zerubbabel and Zerubbabel as the one who should have been king and um, Zechariah as the high priest from a failed nation who should have been the high priest of the temple might be the two witnesses. We'll talk about that down the road. But we also see something else amazing from these two olive trees who are hovering over this bowl in the lamp. Now, to understand the symbolism here, you have to know what kind of lamp we're talking about. In ancient Israel, what kind of fuel would they have used to burn this lamp? It would have been olive oil. And so here is this lamp designed with a bowl, and there are two trees, one on either side. They are stretching over the lamp. They are olive trees. This lamp has a source of oil that is living. You see, this lamp is capable of burning forever because the lamp stand itself doesn't have to have the power. The lamp stand itself doesn't have to have the fuel. The lamp stand itself doesn't have to have the capability. The lamp stand only has to be willing to hold the light. And there is something that is pouring the oil into the lamp stand. Now let me go back to the church. The church does not have to have the power on its own. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. The church doesn't have to have all the answers. The church doesn't have, all, have to have all the best programs. The church doesn't have to have the best preacher. The church doesn't have to have the best singer. The church doesn't have to, uh, have to operate as the best organization that has ever lived. Because there is something outside the church that is able to bring fuel to the church. Yeah. Do you see now maybe who these olive trees are? There is one being, not a creation, because that would be the wrong word. There is one person who specifically is represented by the oil, the anointing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit himself hovers over the church. You see, Jesus is the light shining. The church is willing now to stand here and be used by Christ to shine his light. And we are fueled by the Holy Spirit, who is always there pouring and pouring in. Yeah, you burn a little brighter, he's going to pour a little more fuel in. You, you bring it a little more, you shine your light in the dark corners, you go a little bigger, you push a little further, there will always be more oil. In fact, if you ever feel like your light's burning low, all you have to do is go back. All you have to do is get a fresh drink. Because the olive tree grows so near the lampstand that the fuel is always available. Yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I don't know if he intends to be condescending, but sometimes, sometimes when the Lord opens my eyes and reveals something to me, I feel like I'm a bit of a moron who should have understood it in the first place. And I don't know if that's the intention that the Lord has here with Zechariah. I think not. He says, do you not know what these are? And the prophet says, no, I don't know what, I don't understand what you're showing me. Hey, do you understand that that is a welcomed response from the Lord to you, for you to be honest about your circumstances and your understanding and the walk you have with him? Lord, I'm trying to read this Bible, but I don't get it. Can you help me understand? I've told you the story before about a young Baptist guy who grew up thinking all you guys were weird and whose wife insisted, let's go to this Pentecostal church. Uh, she didn't insist that way, I'm teasing. Uh, yeah. Here we go to this Pentecostal church. And all 
I said to the Lord is, if this is real, then I trust you to show me. I want you to show me if this is real. And guess what? He did. That is a, a response, that is a question that he will always willingly answer. Yes. Amen. And so the, he, he says, do you see? Do you understand? Do you understand yet? Do you get it yet? Because if you don't get it yet, I'll show you more. If you don't see it yet, I'll, I'll reveal it a little further. If you don't understand what the lampstand in the tree is yet, I'm going to tell you what it is. And so he says, no, Lord, I don't get it. And his response has nothing to do whatsoever with the lampstand and the tree of the olive tree, unless you know what the lampstand and the olive tree is. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now this is why it's important. Let me pause because if I keep going, I'm going to miss who Zerubbabel is. Zerubbabel in that time was a real person. He was named the governor of the people going back to Jerusalem, given the right and the materials to begin to rebuild Jerusalem. He's leading the people back to Jerusalem because Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. If Israel had not fallen, Zerubbabel would have been king. That's important to know. Zerubbabel's right-hand man is discussed in the previous chapter, who is now the high priest, Joshua, the high priest without a temple. And here these guys go back. So this is the word of the Lord to the son of David. Zerubbabel, you see, is a reference to Jesus. And so when you see now, this lampstand is not just Israel. This lampstand is also the church. And these olive trees are not just giving uh, olive oil to that lamp. This is the Holy Spirit giving fuel and power to us. And now we see this Zerubbabel is actually the Christ. I'm going to tell you, this is the word of the Lord to Jesus. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I've mentioned it before, but just in case you've forgotten, when it says Lord of hosts, that is a reference to the angel armies of heaven. Uncountable legions of angels in their armor with their weapons. You want to fight? I, I, I can't wait to see it. Um, by the way, every man that has ever seen it has fallen to their knees and wept before them. So this is the Lord of hosts. With unlimited power at his back. This is what he says. You don't have to figure it out on your own. You don't have to get enough guys together. You don't have to have all the right plans. I have the power. And it's the Holy Spirit. The one who pours into you without end. Hallelujah. That's why we're here. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Says the Lord of hosts. So here is... Zerubbabel, trying his best to rebuild Jerusalem, and they can't just get it together. They, he, they, build, they build a pitiful little temple, to be honest with you. Do you. Did you know that the temple that they build isn't even considered a temple by historians? They don't even count it as a, his temple. They count it as a temple that is rebuilt again later. Herod's temple will, will not come for another five, six hundred years. Zerubbabel builds something like this building and calls it a temple. After Solomon's grandeur, Zerubbabel builds something small. And it's all he can do to bring it together. It's all he can do to put it together. Because there is such a great obstacle in his way. And here's what the word of the Lord says to Zerubbabel who is standing in place of a symbol of Christ. Remember, who are you, O great mountain? Who do you think you are that stands in the way of the man of God fulfilling the plan of God? Let me bring it closer to the point. Who are you, great mountain, who thinks to stand in the way of the Christ as he is building his church? That's really what's underneath this. 
Zerubbabel is Jesus. The temple that he's building is us. And the obstacle to it is the whole world. If it were possible for the church to be destroyed, the world would have accomplished it. But guess what? Who do you think you are to stand in the way of the Christ building his church? Who do you think you are, O oh, great mountain? Before Christ, you will be leveled to a plane. The obstacles will be wiped away and destroyed. And he, Christ, shall bring forward the cornerstone. You understand who the cornerstone is? Amid shouts of grace. Grace did. Another way you can translate it is beautiful. And they would have stood there as the final piece was put on the temple and shouted, beautiful, beautiful. They would have shouted, be blessed by God. Be blessed by God. That's another way it can be translated. It means all those things. Grace, grace to the cornerstone who is lifted up. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel, the hands of Christ has laid the foundation of this house. This church. Jesus has laid the foundation of his church. And guess what? His hand shall also complete it. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the small things, the struggling days, the days when you can barely get people to come to the, to the building, the days when we can barely pay the bills, the people who have despised the little struggles along the way, they shall rejoice because they will see Christ is holding the plumb line that measures his church. He is the one who lays the foundation. He is the one that sets the cornerstone in place. He is the one that builds his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. So Jesus is building his church. And that's what Zechariah chapter 4. Now the rest of this has a lot more to do with the witnesses. So I'll pause that and we'll come back to it on another day. He is building his church. Now we go back to the book of Revelation. This is Jesus. The lampstand is his church. The Holy Spirit is pouring himself into the church. The entire function of the church is to lift the light, to hold up the light. And now he speaks to his lampstand. I have built you, informed you, I have stood you up, I have cleaned you up, I have provided the light and the fuel, and now I'm going to do a little business with the lampstand that I have created. To the church at Ephesus, this is chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for one another's sake. I know that you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at the first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at the first. If not, I will come to you. Look, look. I will come to you and remove your left stand from its place. Unless you repent. To the church of Smyrna. Verses 9 and 10. I know your tribulation and your poverty. But, he says, you are more wealthy than you know. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. 
and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. To the church at Pergamum, verse 13. I know where you dwell. I know where you're living. You are living right where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. To the church at Thyatira, verse 19. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. Lord, let this be your word to Harbor Life Church. I know that your latter works exceed the first. To the church of Sardis in chapter 3 and verse 1. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Hear, hear what the Christ says to his last man. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. To the church at Philadelphia, verses 8 and then 10 and 11. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have only little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is about to come on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Amen. To the church at Laodicea, verses 15 and 16 and then 19 and 20. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This is what the Christ says to his church. This is the one. This is the one that I pray becomes his word to us, to Thyatira. I know your works. I know your love. I know your faith. I know your service. I know your patient endurance. And I know that your latter works exceed the first. Can I be honest with you? We're not there yet. that too. We're not there yet. But we are a church who has a remnant that passionately loves the Lord and seeks to be that church. We have a church, we are a church that have some who are awake and pressing in and fighting forward, understanding that we are living in that last day, understanding that it is possible for a church to become so useless to the Lord that he would happily close the doors. Can you fathom that? There are too many of them. We see it every day. And yet, he says, all you have to do is Open your eyes. Wake up. Look around and see there is a community that is dying. There's a community that is failing. 
There's a community that is struggling. Everyone around you is miserable and hopeless. Everyone around you is begging for meaning. They're begging for someone to tell them it's going to be okay. Look, their president can't tell them it's going to be okay because he doesn't have the answers. Their governor can't tell them it's going to be okay. She doesn't have the answer. Their neighbor can't tell them it's going to be okay. They don't have the answer. But there is one who is still the anchor of our soul. There is one who is still able to hold us in the storm. And when we have hope in him, that's all we need. I pray, Lord, that there is still a church in Rockland that holds on to that anchor. And let the storms rage. Because when they see in the storm, in the darkness, when there's no hope left, look, what is that light on the hill? What is that hope I see? Why are those people different from everyone around them? Why are there people that are still fighting to help? Why are there people that are still filled with love? Why are there people that still endure? Why are there people that still serve when there's no point in all the world? It's because there are people that still believe in Jesus. He says, Ephesus, if it was just going by the book, you'd have it all together. But you forgot the love that you had in the first. And to Laodicea at the end, he says, you're just playing games. You're just playing games. And here we are at the end of time, looking for the rapture of the church, looking for the second coming of Christ, Looking to a day that is coming soon when there will be no more opportunity for salvation. And he says to his church, I know your works. And it should scare us to death. This is the eyes of the one that burn with fire because he sees. This is the one with feet like burnished bronze because he has unbreakable authority. This is the one who wields the two-edged sword and brings his truth. And here's what he says. Here's what he says to the people that are fighting with all they have. Here's what he says to the people that are enduring. Here's to the people... Here's what he says to the people that are trying. Here's what he says to the people that are serving. Here's what he says to the people that still have love for their neighbor. He says, he who has an ear, let him, sit, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's what provides eternal life and healing for the nations, by the way. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The second death is the final judgment of the lost. To the one who conquers, I will give you some of the hidden manna. There is only one bread of life who can fulfill, and his name is Jesus. And I will give him, the one that conquers, a white stone, a symbol of of victory and a new name will be written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it your new your eternal name I, i'm temporarily wearing the name casey i'm looking forward to what the eternal name lives and, and i'm doing my best and fighting along the way to live up to the name fearless i feel it in my soul the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. That's Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, you will be clothed in white garments, a symbol of your righteousness. 
the righteousness that was given to you by Christ. And I will never blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall you go out of it. And I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of the heavens, and my own new name. You realize it's the name of your protector, the name of your citizenship, the name of your king. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant you to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is a story about the king and his church. And he says to the people that are attempting to be his church and the people who are playing games at being the church, he says, I see the difference. I see the ones who go through the motions. I see the ones asleep at the wheel. I see the ones who think they've checked a box and they just go home and spend Monday through Saturday like it's any other day. I see the ones who don't care, but I also see the ones who are fighting. I see the ones who are enduring. I see the ones that are struggling. I see the ones that are giving it all they have. I see the ones that are trying. And when you conquer, it will be worth it. Hear what, hear what the Lord says to you. I see. I see it. I see how they've treated you. I've seen what they've said about you. I've seen what they've done to you. I've seen all the things happening around you. I see the mountain that's been placed before you. And I tell you in the name of Jesus, he has the power to flatten a mountain until it becomes a plain. He has the power to lift you up so that his light can shine to all the world out of you. He has the power to fill you again and again and again with his spirit so that you never lack from within. Oh, from without there will be wars and rumors of wars. From without there will be sickness, there will be death, there will be fear, there will be lies. From without there will be a day when they think they're doing a service to God when they kill you. That's what Jesus says to the church. But from within, you will be renewed day by day. From within, I will pour life into you every morning when you wake up. Look, you're going to go to bed weeping. You're going to wake up shouting. That's what the Lord says. You're going to lie awake at 3 o'clock in the morning wondering what in the world am I going to do. And when you get up, I'm going to give you so much peace. You wondered what you were worried about all night long. The requirement of the lampstand is to hold the light. You are not required to make the light shine in a better way. You're not required to change the light so the people like the look of it. You're not required to put a fancy covering over the light so that it's tolerable. You are required to hold the light. And in exchange for your willingness to hold up the light, he offers to give you the power you need, to give you the fuel you need, to give you everything you need. Just keep holding up the light. Hear the word that the Spirit says to the churches. His church has not failed. His body will not fail. His bride is coming 
home. Jesus is going to finish what he started in the churches. Jesus is going to finish building his church. And on that day, on that day, when he brings the completed church home, the beautiful church home, it's sparkling, beautiful, brilliant, spotless. On that day, when your mortal has been shred and immortality has been placed upon you, and all you're wearing is the righteousness of the Christ that you have served, on that day they will know he is the Lord. And we missed it. That's the day that will separate us once and for all. And to his church he says, hold up the light and don't stop now. Miss Rain, can you come forward? We're going to enter into a time of worship tonight. Because I hope that you receive this encouragement from the Lord. I have not failed yet and I'm not starting with you. Amen. Amen. I'm building my church. I'm building this church. And I do not fail. Tonight, I encourage you, enter into a time of worship. The one who is the light, the one who is the cornerstone, the one who is the lamp maker. I sort of like that. That came from the Holy Spirit. The one who knows how to put us all together and bring the pieces into place, the one who lets us be a part of his plan. I'm about to start preaching a whole different sermon, so I'll be careful. Lord, we come to you tonight thankful that we are able to be bearers of your light. Lord, we ask you to remind us of this marvelous privilege that you have called us to, to be light bearers in a world filled with darkness, to remind us that you have offered the power and that you have brought the light and that all we need to do is to be willing. Lord, open our eyes and let us see the dying world around us and let us see that you know our works our struggles, our tribulations, and you will not fail us now. This is our prayer in your name, Jesus. Be glorified in our worship. Amen and amen.